Minh Thúy xin kính chào quý vị hôm nay thứ Sáu, 3 tháng 5, 2024. Đến với VATV hôm nay gồm có phỏng vấn đặc biệt và nhạc lá bồ đề. Kính thưa quý vị, một trong những khó khăn nhất của các chuyên gia phân tích cuộc chiến Việt Nam là ý kiến của người dân. Người dân miền Nam Việt Nam thực sự suy nghĩ như thế nào trong cuộc chiến? Họ có theo dõi sát những biến động thời sự hay không? Người dân ở các thành phố có suy nghĩ khác với người dân thôn quê hay không? Và nếu có thì sự khác biệt đó như thế nào? Tại sao với kỹ thuật và giới truyền thông hiện đại như vậy mà người Mỹ lại không thể giúp cho người dân biết rõ tình cảnh của họ? Hơn nữa, tuy đã biết rõ tình hình nguyên ngập của Sài Gòn rất từ lâu, tại sao Mỹ đã chần chờ không hành động cho đến phút cuối khi việc đã trở thành quá trễ? Xin mời quý vị theo dõi sự suy nghĩ và giải thích của ông Lee Zirice trong phần 6 phỏng vấn đặc biệt do Phan Lê Dũng, Võ Thành Nhân và Minh Thúy thực hiện. What's your personal experience in dealing with the Vietnamese uh, whom you are observing? Uh, how do you think they fare along with? How, how much do they really know about reality? Are they far away from reality? Are they reacting in a too narrow-minded way? Or how, 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 how does it feel for you? I mean, how does a typical Vietnamese feel for you at the time? I guess it very much depends on whether they were out in the villages and hamlets or whether they were in Saigon or another uh, big city. I think that the people who were in Saigon and probably other large cities uh, didn't know much about how the war was going. Civilians I'm talking about. I think that they, and especially at the end, uh, that, that's clear. They did not know, for example, how, how in, in, in what dire straits the government was right at the end. That's well, clear. Was that because of their ignorance, or was that they ill-informed? I mean, they well, informed. They, were, they were they were badly informed, and uh, well, well, first of all, I I don't think many ordinary Vietnamese, say in Saigon, followed the progress of the war very closely. That's that's my guess. I don't think they did. And then you had both the Americans and the South Vietnamese government telling him that things were okay. But clearly, after the, after the terrible uh, botched uh, withdrawal uh, from the northern part of South Vietnam and, 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 and this heartbreaking uh, breakdown, uh, uh, people uh, streaming uh, south and so on and so on, clearly the war was over. War was over, but a lot of people didn't realize that. A lot of civilians in in Saigon didn't realize that because they were being fed information that wasn't accurate. And what's the American role in that? I mean, why why couldn't they get more educated with all the information that we get? Is that well? Because? I'm afraid the Americans did have a role in that, uh, and particularly through uh, Ambassador Graham Martin because he uh, was trying very hard to hold everything together. Uh, he turned out uh, to uh, believe mistakenly that, well, first of all, he was trying to uh, hold, hold together the situation in Saigon and everywhere else that he could. And there are good reasons why one would want to do that. God forbid that, uh, uh, that, that uh, the people of Saigon had risen up and everybody gone to the airport at the same time. It would have been awful. So you can understand that. But I'm afraid that he really believed that there was a chance that there could be an agreement with the communist side that would have allowed a much more orderly exodus from Vietnam and uh, much less uh, turmoil and 
bloodshed. He, he turned out to have been dead wrong about that, and uh, one has to uh, uh, regard that as as uh, a black mark against his uh, uh, his, his ambassadorship at, at the time. Uh, he had. Uh, apparently different kinds of information. He chose to believe information that uh, was not true and, and was never true. Back to your court. Uh, when you were working with the court, generally speaking, how do you see uh, they function with the court? Court, uh, as, uh, as an organization. Uh, I mean, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, courts uh, started out, as you know, in 1967. It was not the first effort to try to uh, engage in pacification in Vietnam. There were previous, uh, uh, two or three previous efforts that, that were seen not to work. There was the Agroville uh, program uh, inherited from the French. There strategic was the strategic Hamlet. Yes. Hamlet program. There was OCO. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but finally, they kind of got it right. Mm. In 1967, they formed this civilian military organization to look after pacification. And it include, uh, as I see it, there were two kinds of, two general kinds of pacification. There was the military side, in which uh, one tried to help uh, the regional forces, the provincial forces, uh, be trained and be able to protect their own areas. Mm -hmm. And then there was the civilian part, which I think today would be called nation building. And uh, I think that there were a lot of achievements in this area. Uh, the Cords uh, the people at, at all of these different levels were building roads, they were constructing markets, they were bringing in uh, TV stations, uh, communication, they were building schools, and, and, and maybe most interesting of all and most important of all, there was the, uh, l the land reform program, the land of the tiller. Now the land of the tiller was not part of Cords, but certainly it was part of the overall effort for, for South Vietnam to become uh, uh, a strong and functioning country. And, and I think it's, it's very interesting today to look back on the land reform program, which, which everybody agrees was a success. Uh, it was done the right way, it was funded by the Americans, mostly. It was, uh, uh, the, gist, the gist of it was that uh, landowners were paid for their land, it was expropriated, but they were paid for it, maybe not as much as they wanted, but more than a token amount. And then it was given to individual farmers. Mm -hmm. Contrast that with the communist land, land reform program of 1953, 54, 55. Yes. First of all, they never paid anybody for the land they took. In fact, they killed a number of mm -hmm. the landowners. Mm -hmm. It was a, just a disastrous, it was such a disastrous and violent program that even they, after three or four years, ha had to pull back and realize they had made a, a lot of big mistakes. Mm -hmm. So what a difference, huh? And, 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 I, and I think that's a, it's a very useful example to bring up when you want to compare these two systems and, and how they operated in the real world. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say the, uh, the knowledge of the certain people were inadequate. The, the said, what, I'm I, sorry, the what? The knowledge, the knowledge about the government, what they're doing, what they're striving for, what they have done in their accomplishment was misunderstood by the uh, South Vietnamese people. Uh, would you say that's a correct judgment? Well, I don't know, but it's easy to believe. Easy to believe. Uh, you know, don't forget that, of course, 
uh, most people, especially outside of the big cities, were constantly subject to propaganda by the communist side, and they were very good at this. Uh, so, yeah, I, I can easily believe that uh, a lot of people were uh, uh, either misled or were just ignorant uh, of what was going on. Kính mời quý vị đón xem phần 7 phỏng vấn đặc biệt với ông Lê G. Rice, nhân viên cao cấp Sở Ngoại vụ, sẽ được phát hình vào tối thứ Sáu, ngày 10 tháng 5, 2024.